Well, thank you, Ensemble. They um, sound good, and I'll tell you a little secret about them. They've been working on this and practicing, and so uh, we appreciate their hard work even before this morning as they put things together for us. And we're thankful to be um, uh, called upon, Brother Mr. Tyler, to be a part of the, uh, the ministry. If I understand it correctly, it's not Tyler's ministry. He's throwing his weight and uh, uh, support behind another ministry, and that's what he's come to do is share that ministry with us. If you'd like to ask him questions after church, you can do that or pray about what you would like to give there. This is our series for Sunday night, and uh, what I'd like to do is just go ahead and move to this morning's sermon. is 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 7, and uh, I know that you recognize this. This is the clay that a potter uses before he or she begins to make something out of it. But 2 Corinthians 4, 7 says something very interesting in this light, so stand, let's read God's Word together. And this is what it says. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels, that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. Because it's just one verse, let's read it again. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels, that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. Father, I pray you bless us now as we consider what you would have for us to be and do. We ask God that our hearts will be open to do just that in Jesus' name. Amen. I'll tell this story, not because I've not told it before, but because it's uh, an impactful one in my life. If you've heard it, you can just um, um, press the pause button in your mind. You don't have to listen. When I was in high school, we had a new bully come to our high school. It's been several years ago, but most communities and most schools have a bully already and so we had a bully already and we had an imported bully so to speak and they got into a fight the very first day they were um, in the um, the men's dressing room at school and like I said it was when I was in high school so it's been quite some time but the new bully said to the other one I'm standing there and the new bully says to the other one just hit me just hit me just hit me. He said it just like that, you know, with a lot of vim and vigor. So the in-resident bully hauled off like this and gave him a roundhouse. I still can see it in my mind in slow motion. You know how TV does things in slow motion. Well, this was in slow motion. He did a roundhouse, hit him right in the, in the chin right here. Blood and one tooth. He lost one tooth in this. I still, I still can see the blood going like this. And the tooth going out like that, that's the first thing I remember about this bully. And that's the first thing. Here's the second thing I remember about this guy. We used to have um, pep rallies. You remember pep rallies? I think they probably still have pep rallies at school. I hadn't been to high school in so long. But I was. we were all in there and a lot of raucous uh, hollering and, you know, stomping on the, the uh, stadium and all things like that. And uh, I'm sitting there in all the midst of all that crowd and all that noise, and I felt something. And I turned around and looked, and that bully was sitting right behind me. And then I put my hand up on my hair like this, and it was wet. And I pulled it down, and I looked back at that bully, and he was just smiling. That guy had spit in my hair. So because I was not the muscular man that I am now, I told him I turned around and sat down and just prayed that he wouldn't spit in my hair again. Because I had seen that him hit that other guy and the blood and the tooth went everywhere. So that's the second thing I remember about this guy. Third thing was Woodward Avenue Baptist Church. We had pep rallies, not pep rallies, but the fifth quarter after the football games right down here on Woodward Avenue. And the kids would come after the football games, and they would get something to eat. We usually had some music. It was a lot of fun. And our youth minister at that time told us to go out there and get the people in. She looked at me, and she said, go out there and tell the people to come in because we're about to have our devotion, which amounted to a little bit of a sermon time. 
And so I start out across there, being, once again, young and dumb, uh, I start out across the parking lot, and at that time, I'm not sure what the lighting is down there in the parking lot now, but at that time they didn't have good street lights, and so I go from, from car to car, and they were all sitting on the hoods of the car. You remember when we used to do that? Sit on the hoods of the car? I would venture to say that kids probably sit on the hoods of cars still these days, but we're getting, I'm working my way down, we're about to have a devotion in the sanctuary, come on in, and the light, further I got away from the building, the dimmer the light got. You get the picture? And I walked up to this car, and I got about as close as that speaker to the car, and I realized that the person I was approaching was the guy who spit in my hair. I didn't want to share the gospel with that guy. I didn't want to be anywhere close to that guy. I was scared to death of that guy. But I swallowed hard and I said to him, and for the record, this is a true story. Uh, the rest of the time I'm just lying. But this, <laughs> this is a true story. I walked up to him and I said, we're about to have a devotion in the sanctuary. We'd love for you to come. All the rest of them laughed at me when I approached their cars. He got out off the car, came into the sanctuary, and two hours later, he was saved. We talked forever. And at that time, I'm a young guy and really never shared my faith much. Certainly didn't know much about how to lead somebody to Jesus Christ. But he was saved. And when I say he was saved, I don't mean he was a little saved. He was really saved. He was so saved, he started coming on Sunday nights and Wednesday nights. Whoa! That's really saved, isn't it? And not only that, it was not uncommon for him to call me and say, I've got the paper here and they're having a singing. You know about singings. They're having a singing down at such and such a church and I want to go. And I, I came real close to saying, well, you know, I've got other things to do tonight because he was saved and I was the guy that led him to the Lord. I felt like I had to go. Amen? Don't look at me sanctimonious now. You've been there and you. some of you are still there. So we would go. I've never seen such a change in all my life. He went from a person who hit somebody in the face and the tooth came out and blood went everywhere to a person who came to church all the time and wanted to tell everybody about his Lord. That's the power, guys, of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It was awesome and it changed me. I hope you can tell that it changed me. We have a treasure the Bible teaches us. Um, you treasure a lot of things. I know you treasure your car. If you lost your cell phone this morning, you would spend an hour or so trying to find your cell phone at church or somewhere else. If you lost your keys, it's very common at church for somebody to come back in and say, I can't find my keys, can't get in the car. A lot of times people lock their keys in the car. We have this kind of thing all the time. If you lost your wallet, you ever lost your wallet? We used to lose checkbooks, but we don't lose checkbooks that much anymore because we got our cards in our pockets and do all those kinds of things. But we treasure a lot of things, and what's important to us really comes out. Well, the gospel is a real treasure. It is not valued as it ought to be, but it's a real treasure because of what I just got through telling you a moment ago. And we have this treasure, verse 7 says, not we're going to have it later on, or we used to have it way back yonder. Can you remember when people got saved like this, way back yonder? Well, I'm telling you, they still can get saved like that. Because the gospel is still there, we have to own the fact that we need to be saved. We have to open up our hearts. But it's not later, it is now. We have this treasure, and it says we have it. Not somebody else, not the preacher. Not an evangelist. We have this treasure. It sounds to me like, from verse 7, it is in our hands. And I think if you go through the New Testament, that's exactly the truth. The church has been entrusted with the gospel of Jesus Christ. The kind of gospel that can change people, like the guy that I was telling you about just a moment ago, it's been entrusted to the church. Now, in verse 6, it tells us what this is. So I want us to back up one verse. We just read verse 7. I want us to read verse 6 and 7. For God, who commanded the light shine out of darkness, has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God 
in the face of Jesus Christ. How did it come? It came through the face of the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 7, But we have this treasure in earthen vessels, that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. We have this treasure, and that treasure, it basically says, is the gospel. Do we understand the power of the gospel? I think not. Jim Reeves wrote a song, and some of you are old enough, some of you are as old as I am, to remember this song. It goes something like, It is no secret What he's done for others He'll do for you With arms wide open Come on! Not exactly ensemble quality, <laughs> but pretty close, pretty close. That's a great song. It's not in our hymn book, or I would have called David and asked him to sing that song this morning. One of the greatest faults of today's church is to get off message. We get off what is the, the message of the Lord Jesus Christ. In Romans chapter 1, verse 16, it says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for it, 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 the gospel is the power of God unto salvation to the Jews first and also to the Gentiles. It is the gospel that we carry. It is not us. It is not me. It is not the church. It is the gospel itself. People can change, just like the guy I was telling you about just a moment ago. We pray about often about our nation. How can it change? It can change if people receive Jesus Christ in their heart of hearts, and their hearts change, their attitudes change, and their hands change, their lives change. Whole lives can be changed. When we receive Jesus as our Savior, we begin to spend some time with Him. Uh, quiet time, yes, but you know, sometimes the best time you can have with the Lord is not a quiet time. It's time maybe when you're driving down the road and you're just with the Lord. Attitudes begin to change and hearts change. No person is beyond his reach. No situation is hopeless. We have trifles with this thing of the gospel. We have neglected this thing of the gospel because we kind of get this attitude, well, everybody knows about the gospel, but they do not. This is why the church is here. Till we've been entrusted with the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. I heard this uh, by an evangelist several years ago. He said, the whole gospel is the whole work of the whole church for the whole age. Uh, it reminds, remind, rhymes, and so that's kind of how I remember that. It's the whole work of the whole church for the whole age. The gospel of Jesus Christ. But we've gotten off that. Several weeks ago now, we went on a little trip, and it was my job to go get more linens, uh, take the old linens to the linen um, place, and get new linens. And so um, the first day I did this, there's a woman there, and I said, I hope, I hope it's okay if we get some new linens. And she said, I'm glad you came. And this is what she said. She said, this is why I'm here. And I'm thinking, there's a purpose statement just like that. This is why I'm here. This is why I'm alive. This is why I have this job, is to help you with this. Later on in the week, I remember this, because later on in the week, I was sent back again. I walked through the door, I said something similar, and she said exactly the same thing. She said, let me help you. This is why I'm here. I'm telling you this morning, First Southern Baptist Church, this is why we're here. It's the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. It is bigger than us. It is bigger than our age. It is bigger than anything that we could come up with, with all our creativity, and with all the strength that we have, all the ability that we have. It is not about us. It's about the gospel. And when we die, and we will, are we going to leave the gospel behind? Will people know about Jesus? Now, verse 7 says, we're just clay. It is brutally realistic that we're just clay. 
In the, New, in the Old Testament, the Bible teaches us that God made mankind first out of mud. Amen for being mud? Everybody on, everybody in here say, I'm mud. Yeah, that's what I thought too. You're mud, I'm mud, but then God does something special with that mud. He breathes life into mud and He makes a human being and the rest is history there. Our bodies in the Bible are sometimes compared to mud and He breathed life into us. The value is not in our bodies. The value of human beings is not even in their minds, as important as minds are. Our value is bigger than that. We're persons made by God. But even at our best, guys, we are still mud. Say it again. Yeah, not with very much enthusiasm. James chapter 4 says, What is your life? It is a vapor. It appears for a little while. And then it's gone. That is the way our lives are. But we are bigger than that. We are weak. We are infallible. Um, we are fallible. We are prone to wander away from God. We are prone to sin. We're not leaning towards holiness. We're leaning away from holiness. Jeremiah said that human beings have deceitful hearts. What is deceitful? This means you can't even trust your own heart. We need the Lord because that's who we are. We're prone to be, uh, bad. On our very core, we're prone to bad, so we need God to help us. And we wonder, though, that God would entrust His church with such a precious treasure as He has. But He has. Why? Well, for His glory. Why jars of clay? Well, the Bible teaches us in verse 7. I want you to read it with me one more time. I think this is the fourth time. Verse 7 says this. We have this treasure in earthen vessels. Listen, here's a purpose statement. That the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. He did it on purpose this way, which is normally the way God works. He does things on purpose. He doesn't do things accidentally, does he? He did it on purpose so the excellency would not be of us. He uses humble, weak, meek people to do big things. Moses in the Old Testament is um, reported to be the meekest man on earth. The meekest man. And look what God did with Moses. You fast forward to the New Testament. And Jesus said, Come unto me, all you that labor and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Learn of me, for I am meek and lowly. Not meek and big and very important. Therefore, you can learn a lot of things. Even Jesus Christ said that he was meek and lowly. You see, humble people can be taught something. And people who are proud, who know everything, well, we say it in Alabama, you can't teach them anything. Conversely, proud, self-willed, self-involved people never really see God because they don't want to see God. They've got it all together. But if you do it God's way, as verse 7 says, He gets the glory and not us. It is His wisdom. It was God's wisdom to allow Satan to put Paul in prison. He was 13 years in prison. And what did he do? God, through Paul, wrote letters to the churches. Why did he write letters? Because he couldn't go there personally. That's why he wrote letters. And you have them in your Bible now. You think that stood the test of time? The letters over the years, thousands of years later, were still, that's God's way. It's God's way to allow Joseph's brothers to throw him in a dungeon so he could go to Egypt and save the Israelites later on when salvation time came. They went to Egypt and they camped out there for a while. They went in uh, voluntarily and then they had to be delivered to get out. But that's what God did. God allowed Satan to crucify Jesus. But guess what happened? He didn't stay in the grave. God, through Jesus, changed that circumstance so it wasn't just Jesus being put to death like a criminal was put to death, but He rose from the dead and in the process He saves us. He chose Peter, God did, who denied Him. And look what God did through Peter, arguably the leader of the disciples of Jesus' time. God chose Thomas, who doubted Him, to show us His glory. And so this is a pattern with God. He chooses the weak 
and the meek and the humble so that he gets great glory. So the point of that is, is that God gets the glory. Now, here is a problem. Men are glory grabbers. We like the glory. We like to have some sort of adulation or some sort of achievement according to our name. We take credit sometimes for what God does. At our jobs, we take the credit for having or have, um, making a job work. Well, it's God who blesses you at your job. I know that you do something, but God could bless or God not bless. And God blesses. It says our successes at home, we take credit for. No, God blesses a home. Uh, you don't have a good home. It's a blessing of God. Churches are the same way. Uh, in churches, you have some, some Sunday school classes that really do well. They grow a lot. And some classes who don't. But God is the one who adds to the church. You have this church that grows a lot and this church that doesn't. Maybe some sort of transition or something. It is God who gives the increase. It's not the preacher and how good he can preach. It's not the friendliness of the church. It is God who gives the increase. And we, being the glory grabbers that we are, like to take credit. We like to go to listen to someone, in, somebody whose um, you know, church is really doing good and say, oh, what a wonderful person he is. God gives the increase, not any person, no matter how good they are. And in the end, all along, we understand it's always been about God, not us. Because you see, we are just jars of clay on the one hand. But on the other hand, by His glorious grace, He has placed within us this treasure whereby people like that young man in high school that I ran into could receive Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, can begin to follow Him and their whole life be changed. God deserves the glory. In the end, it's all about Him anyway, isn't it? Father, forgive us for sometimes trying to steal Your glory. Father, forgive us for allowing ourselves to feel so smug and good about me and not remember that it's You, always You, that makes all the difference in the world. Father, we are thankful that you have entrusted to us, as your church, the gospel of Jesus Christ. Help us to never neglect our opportunity to share the good news that Jesus can, can and does love everyone, and that Jesus can save anyone, and that God, he can make something beautiful out of mud. We pray, God, that you would do great things to us and through us, but not for our glory. Always.